que je commence à l'écrire, c'est comme ça que je l'écris. <rire> So we are going to start the meeting in a minute. Please go to your chairs. People at the end of the room, please close the door. Or your own security and safety, please close the door. <laughs> Okay, so this is the uh, LP1 working group. We have Dominique Bartel here acting as chair. Alex is not with us. Um, he's the proud father of a uh, young Leonard. So we welcome Leonard to this group. And um, so hello to, to Alex who will be joining us from Itico, but um, it was much easier that just Dominique would stand with me uh, at the chair. So with this, we're staying. As usual, we won't distribute the blue sheets immediately. We'll wait like to 10 to 15 minutes for the usual uh, late people. So this is uh, an IATF official meeting. All the best practices of IATF meetings apply, in particular, the rules about patents, if you're aware of any IPR that applies to the discussion uh, that takes place in this room, whether it's from your sponsors or whoever, please uh, let us know or refrain from uh, talking about this. And uh, if you don't want to speak during the meeting, you may always talk to the chairs after the meeting. But the other best pro uh, practices also apply, anti-harassment and all the others, so they are listed on this page. The meeting is being uh, filmed and recorded, and actually it will be published on Yahoo, on YouTube, I'm sorry. And, and uh, actually what's very cool is you can extract the transcripts from the, the, Yahoo, the YouTube page. So I'm sure you can make a rule that translates uh, Yahoo into YouTube and fix me. So um, yeah, so, so everything is recorded, minutes are being taken, blue sheets will be distributed. I want to make sure that uh, we have people joining the uh, etherpad, that's the mean we use to take minutes. What's very cool is you can join it online. And if you speak to the mic, please check after that what you said was captured correctly. Make sure that your name was captured correctly so we publish uh, accurate minutes. Okay, so please all join the etherpad and, and review the minutes as, as they're being taken, mostly if you've been speaking. So who can take minutes? To, okay, we have two, three minutes. Is there somebody on the, on the jabber? Ivanio, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ivo. Okay. Um, and then the, all the material is available on this page. Uh, it's, uh, it's also available from the agenda page on the ITF site, and that's actually what we use to go from, from presentation to presentation. So we have uh, a lot on our plate today, but we have two hours, so I'm kind of uh, confident that we won't have any uh, problems, so I won't be pressing people, I don't think so. The, the new thing compared to the agenda that we had published uh, until the bar date is that uh, we have a, an interesting presentation on a sheet implementation coming from Chile. So um, this one will be actually appended to uh, the presentation by Dominique. So in those 15 minutes, I guess Dominique will speak for like 10 minutes and then we will be able to, to discuss, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, psychic? I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the by the, the, <laughs> so, so we'll be able to, to, to discuss that as well. You will have some time. Uh, then uh, Sigfox, LoRaWAN. So this time there was a lot of work done on the LoRaWAN specification, many discussions on the mailing list. So we, we gave more time to Ivo so he can actually tell us the, the best and latest about how um, the, the LoRaWAN profiles check. Then the data model. And uh, actually, I just got a, a text from Suresh. He said, I won't be joining the meeting immediately. Start without me. He said, yes. Um, if, if Suresh is not there at the time of the, the young thing, I would like to push it till he arrives. But I guess he will be there because it's, it's now, an hour from now. Uh, then the co-op static 
context OEM. So Dominique will step to, to discuss OEM again. And uh, Carles will show us the progress on the RTO the discussion. Um, Charlie was supposed to, to present, to give us an, an IEEE status. As it goes, um, Charlie did not uh, join the Mitsiko, so I don't know if he will be with us. If, if Charlie, you could join, let us know. Do you see Charlie on the Mitsiko? I don't. So I'm not too sure that we will have Charlie this time, but uh, okay, we'll get the news next time. And, um, and then we'll discuss rechartering because we are pretty, I mean, the, the basic, oh, sorry, sure, here. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the barring thing for rechartering was uh, to complete Chic. So Chic is now passed, so we can really actively work on the recharter now. And that's it. So as I just said, our main uh, work item is now complete. That's the baseline Chic technology, and that was the main effort in this group. Um, we plan to submit the co-op compression to ASG in November. Laurent, are we still in line with this goal? I think we are from the last intro. From, from, from your perspective, it's okay. Um, so we'll have, we'll have a, a discussion at the end about Richard Turing, Suresh. That's pretty much it for the intro. Any bashing? Hello, good morning. And so this is a status about the basic chic draft. IPv6 uh, static context. We're currently in uh, version 21. Um, so I'll spend just one minute or two uh, remembering people what this draft is about. So if you're new to the working group, if you haven't looked at that before, you, here's your chance to understand what this is about. And then I'll uh, go over what we've done since last IETF meeting, a little report on the hackathon we had the uh, weekend just before this week. Um, what's coming up uh, after this. And in the back of the slides I have the list of changes. If, if there's any question on what exactly we did, uh, we can go over that, but otherwise I'll just skip it. And then uh, we'll, okay. So what is draft about? Uh, I like to say there are three deliverables in one draft. Uh, one deliverable is a generic comp uh, header compression mechanism that uses a static context. Um, this gives the name shake to the whole uh, technology, uh, static context header compression. So it's that part in blue in my protocol stack here. Um, an option IPv6 UDP, but actually nothing in this header compression mechanism is dedicated to this upper protocol. So we can apply it to anything that's regular, has things like, that look like headers. Um, in the same draft, we also have the specification of a fragmentation protocol, and we have three versions of fragmentation, three modes, uh, which address different uh, underlying network requirements. Uh, these are the three boxes I've described here, and it's kind of uh, compression over fragmentation. It's not really encapsulated. That gets people a little bit confused sometimes. We need to be better at explaining. Uh, and in the same draft, we have a a simple example, I would say, of how we can apply compression to IPv6 UDP. It's simple because we don't consider IPv6 versions, uh, uh, options, sorry, and so all the fields are happen only once and they are fixed in position, fixed in length, so it's pretty simple. And the, the more uh, complex stuff comes with a co-op. So this is a red box here. So you will find these three things in the same draft. Um, and so other drafts do the rest of the stuff, like this red box shows the, the co-op draft, so it applies header compression to all this uh, upper protocol stack. And the other drafts, like uh, Chic over Sigfox, Sig over Laura, that we'll hear about today, uh, do these red boxes, how do we apply 
mostly fragmentation over um, various technologies because they have their own specificities and so they pick one or two or three of the fragmentation modes and set parameters so that it fits the characteristics of the underlying technology. So that's my view of the whole work we're doing in this working group. Um, yeah, and so far the draft uh, I'm talking about has uh, specified the uh, format of uh, frames that go over the air, uh, or that we pass onto the underlying layer, uh, but so far we haven't defined how we express, how we represent the rules that are used for compression and fragmentation. So part of the other drafts uh, propose a representation of the, the context, you know, the rules, the parameters for fragmentation and everything. So this is not in this draft. Okay, what has happened since the last meeting? Um, so, fairly long list of technical stuff, but we had the IoT idea uh, review by Carsten, which was only part of the document. Uh, we discussed with Carsten at Prague and agreed on most of the changes. We improved uh, the description of uh, ACON error mode. There was uh, mistakes in the description. Um, we received, received an AD review by Suresh, um, etc. Completed IT flash call. I haven't heard of any comment, so so far looks good. And we published 20 and 21 uh, in the last few days. Uh, so the current status is waiting for write up, uh, and you can probably see more. Yeah, Suresh Krishnan. So it's like a procedural step for me to issue a ballot. Like, so it gets like on the next available telechat. So that's, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. So I just wanted to know like if there's any other edits you've queued up. Uh, there's, there's nothing. As of today, nothing. There's nothing, right? So I'll issue the ballot because um, what has happened like a couple of times now is like I issue the ballot and the author updates the draft after saying, hey, I got this review and I'm fixing it, right? And then the some of the IEHG read an older version and some of them read the newer version. And that kind of like I wanted to avoid that. And anyway, it's ITF week. Usually, you don't do anything like for like because nobody's going to start working on it. So uh, this afternoon, I'll issue the ballot, and it'll get on like next like depending on number of pages. So uh, previously, you would play stuff explicitly on a telechat, but now it's like automatic. So it looks at the reading load and then puts it on the telechat. So I'm expecting the 22nd of August, it'll be on a telechat. Okay. okay. So it gives like people time to read the stuff, like all the direct rate reviews and everything, and so on. Whatever is like left over, um, because uh, some of the direct rates do last call and telechat reviews separately. So like Genart, for example, does it separately. So they do a last call review and look at the updates and do a telechat review after. Okay. So I don't expect any anything to come out of it, but they they do want the the time to do that, so they kind of expect like a two week window. So that's why I'm saying twenty second would be a good date. So, and uh, if you want, like Pascal, like Dominic, like Laura, if you want to be on the call, you can be on the call. You cannot speak unless, like, you know, I kind of ask you to, but you can be on the call. Anybody can be an observer on the call. Um, but I could ask, say, like, hey, like, you know, if I have some questions for you, you can actually answer it. So it gets done quicker rather than wait another two weeks. Okay. Yeah. If possible, I'd like to be on the call yeah, because thanks. I've uh, never. So I'll send ever... the, uh, the WebEx uh, information okay. uh, to you, to the, all the authors in the chairs. So you can decide if you want to join. So it's about. It's uh, 4 p.m. Uh, in France, like uh, Thursday. Okay. Always, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Um, just, okay. just a quick re report on the hackathon. So um, there were 10 team members uh, over the weekend here. Um, well, seven here and three remote uh, from Chile, Spain, and Japan. So actually, it was a the uh, Soichi worked uh, overnight for us, and when we came back in the morning, he had done quite a lot of work over our night. So that was really great. Um, and so we we basically worked on two fronts. One is uh, make OpenSheet easier to use, so producing documentation, cleaning up, adding a tutorial, how you get the thing started, uh, and also improve the functionalities of uh, the code. Uh, uh, quite a lot of work merging several branches that are kind of diverge um, between meetings. And so we now have a compression and fragmentation integrated into the same branch, same code, which wasn't the case before. Uh, and I'll talk about OAM later. 
Um, coming up legs, uh, well, I think Suresh described what is going to come in terms of uh, the draft itself, and we want to communicate more about Czech, educate people about Czech. We get lots of questions, I don't quite understand how this works, etc. So we agreed, kind of agreed we'll prepare a full-blown tutorial on Czech that we can play to the lower alliance or other groups that are interested. Uh, carry on uh, with OpenShake, of course, and uh, I know this academic work to evaluate performance and applicability. Um, this is kind of outside the draft itself, but just to communicate with you the, the kind of interest we, we get uh, about Shake. So, of course, there are, there are other drafts of this same working group that use Shake, obviously, but uh, there are demos uh, happening. Uh, uh, co UDP IPv6 compression over lower one over six forks uh, already a couple of years ago. Uh, co op compression over LTM, so we're not compressing UDP IPv6, but just the co op part of an IP enabled network and still getting benefit of the compression. So, just again to mention that co op is not, uh, Shake is not dedicated to the IP uh, layer, to, to sit below the IP layer. It can sit at any, any point in the stack. It's a sit over lower one. And um, Sheik is being evaluated at the lower lines for the DLMS uh, transmission over lower one. So they have DLMS over UDP IPv6. And so we have uh, UDP IPv6 over lower one. So that could solve their problem. Uh, Daniel here is interested in using Sheik for IPsec ESP compression. And in terms of uh, implementation, we have OpenShake, uh, which I already mentioned. We have Aclio, uh, they have commercial code, uh, both in C and Go language, uh, both for the device and the network server, uh, commercial grade, um, operational. And I just heard uh, last week about the new implementation, so Sandra is going to tell us a little bit about this just after my, my presentation. And Riot have expressed interest. They are not currently actively working on it, but they have intention of implementing, implementing OpenShake in Riot, either by rewriting a C implementation, which would be therefore a different implementation, or by uh, running MicroPython over Riot and then using reusing some of the open sheet code. Okay, well, uh, do you want me to go over the changes? Do you have any specific question? Oh, no, it's there for reference. So I guess, Sandra, you can tell us about your implementation. Any question? Forward backwards, please. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm Sandra Céspedes from Universidad de Chile. And uh, I will present a work from, uh, actually, this is a work from Rodrigo. He's a master's student. And uh, this year we started uh, implementing uh, the draft for uh, Sheik over Lower One. So I'll just give a brief report of what is the status of this uh, implementation. So basically this is the architecture that we are using. This is an experimental uh, setting. So uh, we have a low pi end device, which is connected to a rack uh, wireless uh, gateway. And then this connects to the, the things network and uh, the other part of Chic is implemented in uh, Amazon Web Services. So he's using an API gateway, uh, talking via REST to the network server. And the actual implementation of Chic is in, in Lambda function inside the AWS services. So this is the status of the implementation. What you see uh, here on the right is the, the modules that are that are part of the implementation. So basically we have a big module with compression decompression and the other module is for fragmentation and reassembly. The one that is almost ready is the first part, the compression decompression. This has a, a compressor which gives uh, the output is the, the chic packet. And then uh, the decompressor which receives the chic packet and uh, uh, the output is an IPv6 plus the UDP packet. 
And then there is a parser that gives us access to all the headers in a chic packet and the rule manager, which is the one that loads the specific rule that we need to apply for, for a compression action. So all the rules are implemented outside uh, in a dictionary, and then the rule manager just loads the specific rule that we need to apply for, uh, for a compression. And then, uh, so this is uh, uh, around 90% ready. The fragmentation and reassembly module, this is in charge of another student, so I will see his work next week. And then I can tell you if uh, this is also working or not. I, I, I couldn't say yet if it's working. Um, I already said this. So so far, we uh, we have uh, tested the, the uplink for the compression, uh, and it's working. We haven't yet tested the downlink, but the code is, is there. It's ready. We just need to, to do the testing. Uh, and also for the fragmentation, we haven't done any, tested, uh, any testing uh, yet. What we have pending still, so this 90% comes that, uh, from the fact that we haven't yet implemented these two uh, compression to compression actions, which is mapping set and LSD, basically because so Rodrigo said he's connected, actually. He said that uh, he wasn't using them, and so he just uh, skipped the implementation uh, for now. And then, as I said, we need to test the, the downlink for the compression, and we want to do an end-to-end testing with uh, with uh, all the IP connectivity end to end. So this is uh, this is going to be the last part to test. So we plan to do it first for only for only for the compression and then we have when we have the fragmentation code we do the the, the complete thing. And um, I was going to say something else but I forgot. So that, I think that's about it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for this presentation. It's very interesting to, to have plenty implementation so maybe we can try to make some interrupt in uh, uh, as soon as you give year. us rules right yes. format for rules and uh, for um, do you implement co-op no not yet just UDP okay. Uh, yeah it's just UDP. and and uh, and also we plan to make the, the uh, code public so it's not there yet we haven't documented the code yet but it's going to be available so we will tell the group when the code is is ready to to access if I will be sure. Uh, so I, I understand that your fragmentation is 50% uh, ready, but uh, did you look at the lower one, uh, ship of a lower one draft or on the, the base draft? Both, both, yes, both, both of them. So I, what I understand is that uh, Rodrigo, whatever he couldn't find in one, he just went to the general one and then implemented what the general one said. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We're very interested in your feedback. Um, if, if you saw anything missing, you know, trying to do this coalescence of the Laura one and then the main yeah, draft. He, if, if there we, was any we started question, doing that. Yeah he, yeah, he he emailed a couple of times and then we'll keep doing that if we find something. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I understand he will be at the next meeting in Singapore, right? Uh, Me? No, uh, I mean you or Rodrigo. Your... Uh, Hackathon, yeah. So yeah. maybe we can plan for interrupt. Let's work on that. Yes. I, I hope it's very clear to everyone in the room that uh, what, what's really critical now is to get a common format for the rules so we can feed the rules into both implementations and try one implementation on one side and the other implementation on the other side, right? Right now it's kind of blocking us for interrupt because we can't express the rules in the fashion that both codes can digest. So that's really the next important step for us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Juan Carlos Zuniga from Sigfox. So I'm going to uh, talk about the, the draft uh, IETF LP1 chic uh, over Sigfox. Uh, just a quick note to, say, to welcome the, the new member in the group, because uh, Alex is not here. And I think uh, I saw Alex in the note there. So congratulations, Alex, on the arrival of the new member. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, uh, very quick update. Um, there is uh, we we have done mo modifications to the draft. Uh, what we've been doing is working on uh, optimization of the C uh, chic parameters for payload uh, fragmentation and data integrity over Sigfox. As a reminder, Sigfox uh, has a 
fixed uh, say, uh, size for the payload. So in the uplink is 12 bytes and the downlink is eight. So ba basically we can we can optimize for that one single uh, frame size that, that is not changing. And that's the idea to, to make sure that, that we get to the, to the best possible numbers for the different applications that we foresee. To, to use this data integrity and, and fragmentation. Uh, so we have two basic scenarios. The first one is a single byte header uh, that is uh, right now optimized for uh, minimum overhead uh, in uh, providing an act size of uh, 13 bits in the downlink. Uh, and the other one is a two byte uh, chic uplink header that is optimized for maximum payload um, with an act size of 30, 43 bits in the downlink. So this is more or less what the, the simulations look like uh, if we want to push the limits. Uh, with a single byte header, we can go all the way to roughly 300 bytes, uh, a little bit over that, but uh, 300 bytes uh, comfortably. And this is using the icon error mode. Uh, <coughs> so the idea, <coughs> sorry, the idea is to uh, support the, this payload uh, with as little as a single uh, byte and 13 bytes are needed meaning that in the best case scenario, if there are no fragment losses, of course, we will use a single a single downlink message to support all those uh, uh, messages sent in the uplink to support 300 bytes. Uh, for a two byte uh, chic uh, uplink header, uh, again, on the icon error mode, uh, we can support all the way to 2000 bytes, not necessarily that uh, it's uh, recommended, but that's uh, what it would work. Uh, then uh, again, one as little as one single act would be needed to support all that uh, payload. And uh, in this case, it'll be a 43-bit uh, act that fits perfectly fine in the in the Sigfox uh, downlink. So we plan uh, to keep working on this and of course, <clears throat> bring, in, bring it to, to implementation uh, to try to test the, the limits of the protocol and see how we can, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> We can we can further optimize the the, the protocol. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Wilkos. <clears throat> and uh, the next presentation will be will be. <laughs> <laughs> They're taken care of. We need you. <laughs> my gauche, c'est my gauche. Si tu viens, Laura Wan, il va, il va où si on met vous? So you have twenty-five minutes. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Ivan Petrov, and I will be presenting the advancement of the Shikova Lower One draft. Uh, so, I will start by uh, giving you a little bit of context about Lower One. Then, I will present you the changes that happened since the last ITF, and then I will tell you what was some of the rationale for the. Uh, changes that we did, and we can have a discussion if you have any ideas or any comments. So in LoRa, there are three types of devices, uh, three classes. Those are class A, B, and C. Class A are the most constrained ones that can receive downlinks only after sending an uplink. Class B have uh, some time slots at which they can receive downlinks and class C could receive downlinks at any time. Uh, obviously, this is important in terms of uh, how the fragmentation is specified because some timers uh, might differ between the different classes. Then there are confirmed and unconfirmed messages uh, that I will also tell you a little bit more about what is our opinion uh, a little bit later. And uh, another particularity of Flora one is that there are multiple implementations of network servers and device stacks, which means that uh, there might be some differences in implementations that uh, do not allow 
to use some of the nice properties of the underlying layer. And so there are uh, parts in the Mac layer headers that could vary in size or that could be useful for us to use, namely fopt and fport, uh, which I will show you in a second how they, they are structured. And the last particularity that I want to mention right now is that uh, due to some differences in regulations in different countries, the maximum uh, size of packets is quietly different between uh, optimal radio conditions and suboptimal radio conditions in some parts of the world. So this is also something we have been taking into consideration when uh, providing the parameters uh, for the lower one, for the chic uh, fragmentation. So as you can see in this uh, um, picture, we have different uh, headers in the lower one uh, packets and uh, some of them, namely the FOPs used for uh, optimization of uh, radio um, of the radio links and some other things that are below IP, uh, but they can vary in size, which could make a little bit harder the, the selection of most optimal parameters for all types of payloads sizes. And then there is the effort that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, mostly for applications to specify what uh, what is the payload about. And uh, I will explain you how we use it in order to communicate information related to uh, Chic or YD. So since uh, the last ITF in Prague, um, our document was adopted by the working group and uh, it was in version three. Now we have published two new versions and uh, we received some very useful feedback. So thank you everyone that uh, gave us uh, some ideas, some recommendations. Uh, so, here are the changes that went in the document since uh, the version that was accepted by the working group. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think there's something in the air here. <laughs> uh, so, um, I have been talking about some of them uh, at the last ITF, but they were not part of the, the draft, so as uh, some of them still change, so I will present them again here. Uh, so we uh, updated the information, uh, we updated the, we got in sync with the uh, base document. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so we uh, got in sync with the base document and updated some of the terminology and some of the figures to match the base document. Uh, we decided to switch to ACON error for uplink fragmentation as we believe it will be more optimal for those cases. Uh, for the downlink fragmentation, we decided to keep the ACOIS mode as class A devices will need to be sending uplinks in order to be able to receive the downlinks anyway. Uh, so we provided some more details how LoRaWAN terminology maps to ITF terminology so that people from both uh, uh, SDOs can read the draft easily without uh, having to keep too much information in uh, their heads. 
and uh, we decided to replace the quite generic term devices, which seem to be confusing for some readers with the more precise one and devices where it was appropriate. So we then decided to split the F port up that we were using for a fragmentation into two so that we have one which is more optimal for smaller packets and one that can handle the requirements of uh, uh, IPv6 packets. Yes, Julian? Yeah, Julian from Kerlink. So are those two ports dedicated to fragmentation or are they used also for uh, compression? And those, uh, well, one of the EF port has uh, the possibility to be used also for um, compression, whereas the this is the F uh, port up default and the F port up short is only for fragmentation. Basically, in F port up short, you don't have any space for additional row IDs, so you have effectively only one row ID. And in the case for F port of default, you have space for other row IDs. So one of them is for fragmentation and the rest of them are for compression. So my opinion is that it's very confusing uh, that having the same F port to, for compression and fragmentation for the F port of default. So I would, I would advise that we select F port for fragmentation only, maybe several if we need optimization, mm -hmm. and having a dedicated uh, uh, compression F ports if needed. The rationale behind that is that uh, the rule ID and uh, the rest of the payload below, mm -hmm. after that is different in fragmentation than in compression. So actually having several uh, rule ID for F port of default has no use in fragmentation itself, and it's consuming a lot of bits in my view. Okay, that's interesting. We can consider it. Yes, Dominic. Uh, Dominic Patel, um, as an individual, um, I think the way it's described uh, currently, uh, I think it's confusing. Uh, it's being this use of f ports and roll numbers. Um, it's basically the way, and I've had this discussion on, on the mailing list, this is not new. Uh, the way it's currently described, it looks like you have actually three instances of shape or of, of the context uh, separately, and F port selects one of the instances. For example, the F port up short uh, designates one context which has only one rule, therefore, you need zero bits to identify the rule ID. And then the port of default has an 8 bit uh, space for rule ID. So, um, either you, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but then you should, I, I believe, describe it this way. We have three contexts that are selected by F port. Or uh, the way I propose on mailing list, you uh, describe rule IDs to include this F port, right? And so you say we use rule uh, ID numbers that have at least 8 bits. Mm -hmm. uh, which overlap with this F port of lower one and maybe have some other bits, so variable length encoding. Mm -hmm. And the F port up short uses only a bit and with a known pattern, which is this value of F port. So, in the vision of shape, this means you have only one context with rules of variable uh, ID length. Um, mm -hmm. So, either one or the other. It, obviously, at the end, it's exactly the same thing. Yes. You get the same compression, same frames out of the the, the stuff, but the description would be clear. So pick one okay. uh, of the two, but it should be clear, I think. Okay. Did you actually propose text, Dominique? Yes, uh, I did. Okay. On the mailing list. Uh, but I'm going to work with uh, Olivier probably on Monday uh, again, try to make my point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from, from Java, uh, Rodrigo Munoz is uh, pointing out that on some platforms you cannot access the F port. So, for example, in PyCon. Okay. 
Um, but Olivia is Olivia is uh, answering that that it's possible there. So, so Olivia can come to the mic. So I will just hello, him. Olivia. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Rodrigo, you can access um, the F portions of PyCom. I think it's um, the LoRaWAN structure dot socket or something like that. I can't find the documentation if you want. If it's a LoRaWAN certified device, you should be able to access uh, FPorts because it's a part of the LoRaWAN specification. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah, so Rodrigo, if uh, you have questions, you can find the email of uh, Olivier and ask him. He will be glad to help you, I'm sure of it. Okay, so I carry on. Uh, so we have selected tile size of three bytes. And in order to be able to optimize for the different radio conditions, as I said earlier, in some regions, the maximum packet size is 11 bytes. And in case there is uh, some F opts that are present, this might be reduced even further. That's why we decided to keep some flexibility there. And uh, yes, we updated the terminology to match that of the uh, Dash 18 version of the sheet draft and added extra examples. Yes, Dracan. Yes, just one precision the title of three byte is just for the F up uh, short or is for every fragmentation? Yeah, it's for every fragmentation. And uh, yes, we received some feedback from the chairs that we need to reorganize the author list, so we did that. And uh, yeah, we had, uh, we handled some minor other comments from the working group as well. Uh, so yes, and uh, here is an example of the. Uh, lot format so we have uh, at the upper side of the slide the um, regular packet for the short version and which doesn't have row ID and window uh, number and uh, we have in the down part of the slide the uh, fragmentation where we have those two additional fields <laughs> So one is for F port short and the other for the F port up and default. Um, in the short version, we have uh, DTAC, F count, and then the payload. And uh, we only use one byte for the additional header. Yes. So Julian again from Kelly. Uh, I have more, it's more questions for the chic orders. Uh, T tag one bit, uh, is it very is really useful in, in such case or is it something uh, we can skip? I was wondering if um, lower one case the D tag being one bit is useful or not. D tag has two functions. The first one is. And please to state use, your name. Uh, Laurent Tutin, I am the Atlantic. <laughs> Uh, so the tag has two functions. The first one is to merge different uh, fragments together, but it's also when you finish your transmission, you have to delay and wait if you have some, if you lost the lag section measurement. So you must keep your context for a certain period of time. So using the D tag, it allows you to send another fragment and don't wait for this period of time. Julien again from Kermic. Uh, so this means that you can uh, mix up two sessions or two uplinks uh, with the data with uh, one bit? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, um, I believe we said in the beginning of the draft for the yeah. one that uh, yeah. we do not enter leave uh, fragments. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, Dominique, um, so yeah, I was surprised to see this uh, data bit here, uh, even though you said you don't need any fragments, so you could do without. 
And I think you added it uh, just for extra safety, but I don't think it's mandatory. Okay. Only yeah, I think it's for extra safety. Yeah. Maybe Olivier will want to add something. Yes, Olivier. Do you hear me? I have connection issues. Okay, very well. Yeah, perfect. So uh, we added the tag just in case of uh, error recovery because it's faster to detect um, an issue when the detect change. But we specify that we don't want to use and to mix uh, two sessions at one time because we are in uh, embedded context with a lot of constraints. So it will reduce um, program size and all, all memory and RAM needed in microcontrollers and simpli simplify implementations. All good. But it, it was when we thought that uh, it was better to have byte aligned headers. It was a mistake, so it can be discussed and we are open for all feedback on that. I figure that if you have all sorts of timeouts and race conditions, that avoids race conditions with timeouts happening somewhere. I guess it's a good idea. Thank you, Olivier. Okay. Uh, so, yes, and uh, here you can also see the format of the acknowledgement. I hope that doesn't come as any surprise for people that know the original chic draft. Uh, so, yeah, we have the data, the C bit, the encoded bitmap in case of uh, um, an error. I mean, missing fragment and then padding as needed. So, carrying on uh, for the version two, we mostly did some very small changes, fixed some figures, updated the reference to dash 19 and made sure that uh, uh, we are in sync with this version of the draft and uh, fixed some examples and added some more. So should I get a note again from Kelly? Uh, I have a, another question for examples. I saw that there are not byte bind in the sheet compressions. I'm a bit afraid of the implementation issues it can break. So the compression residue is not byte aligned and the payload comes right after. So I guess this is a decision you make here. But could you give some more rational? Um, so the decision for the residues themselves to be uh, bit is for compression efficiency. So if there's only one bit of entropy in some field, then we only send one bit on the wire. Um, and then the question was, do we pad uh, to a byte alignment after the residues before the payload? But then um, I think the reason was that we would get two paddings and in case of fragmentation. And so we decided we'd pad only once. And that's why we, we st stuck the payload right after the residues. And we, we work under the assumption that shifting is a uh, no cost. It's a uh, one CPU cycle. And so extracting the bytes uh, with shift doesn't cost compared to sending a bit on the, on the link. So more computation power than transmission opportunities. And there are long threads on the mailing list on that, so you can dig more and come back to us and ask questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, just for uh, to make a point, uh, shifting is quite easy, but shifting 38 bytes, like in the example we have, uh, might be uh, might be complex for the implementers. But okay, yeah, fine. Double uh, double uh, adding is is the version. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, now things that uh, have been discussed as possible upcoming changes is to remove the restriction of the row ID size. Um, basically, 
right now we are saying we recommend uh, people to use the two F ports and uh, have row size of six uh, bits, but in some applications that might be insufficient, in others it might be more than enough. So um, the comments that we received was to try to reorganize the draft so that we don't have these restrictions. And this is something we intend to do, have some uh, specified row IDs that are recommended for uh, fragmentation, maybe still keep two of them. That is something we'll have to to decide. I think we'll keep two of them. Um, but in any case, the applications should, uh, I mean, implementers should have the flexibility to decide what is the optimum row ID size for them. And uh, there have been some small uh, typos and some small um, details that were miss, uh, missing in the draft and that were maybe confusing a little bit implementers. So uh, we will be fixing those. So it's now about some more technical details. In Lora there is uh, a bit which is called fpending which can tell an end device that the network has some more data to send to it. Uh, in the draft we explicitly state that we don't want to rely on this thing because it is um, not handled um, very well by some of the implementations so it might cause some issues and uh, similarly for confirmed versus unconfirmed messages it is possible for some stacks to send a confirmation um, before the chic and the chic layer can actually add any extra payload and the confirmation uh, could very well be uh, piggybacked with the chic payload, so it didn't make too much sense to use confirmed messages in this regard. We might be sending more messages than needed. So now a little bit more details why we decided to uh, use tile size of three bytes. Um, after some consideration and running some experiments, uh, we found that this is this seems to be the optimal uh, tau size if we want to be able to both uh, from time to time send uh, some Mac commands using the F opt uh, header in lower one, and at the same time be able to say uh, to send big um, payloads without using too much uh, uh, size in the in the bitmaps. The bigger tiles improve the bitmap size, but uh, at the same time, as I said, we have less flexibility. So what is remaining uh, right now is to finalize the IID computation. There is some text already uh, regarding this thing, but uh, I believe it needs to still be improved. And I think that this is the only pending uh, thing to do, except, I mean, if we receive any more reviews, we'll be more than happy to, to discuss if there are other things to change, but this is the only thing that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I have one more thing I would like to, to ask the chic others about the message antiquity code to so the, the CRC32. Can we use another algorithm? In LoRaWAN, we do not have this CRC uh, for the standard implementation, but we do have the message integrity codes, which are based on AES-C Mac. Is, is it uh, foreseeable to, to use that? Okay, Dominique. So uh, your question could be twofold. Are you talking about removing the 
the check at fragmentation or implemented an implementing another uh, uh, computation to for the check maybe implementing one one other okay so it's totally possible the draft says uh, crc 42 with this default polynomial is a recommended uh, algorithm but you can implement your own uh, as long as you feel it's uh, robust enough for the purpose so that's that's fine Thank you. So we would like to get some more reviews, of course. More reviews are always welcome. And uh, we believe that we should be ready for last call before the next ITF. What is the chair's view on the process? Uh, I mean, if there are no remaining questions, then document is stable, the chairs are more than happy to go for work group last call. So I've seen just one issue that needs to be resolved is this longer normal F ports in discussion okay. to format. That's the only discussion I've seen. Mm -hmm. So once you complete that, uh, yes, we would like to have one or two reviews from the room just to, to make sure, uh, you know, that some things are caught before work group last call. So um, are there two people in this room who could volunteer to review the document? Georges? And even one more hand, yeah. Dominique. Okay, so please sort out the, the issue of Dominique, mm -hmm. and then I will ask Georges and Dominique is already on it anyway. But then I'm biased. Yeah, <laughs> but for that one issue, yeah, but there's all the rest of the documents. So, so, so please, and, and then yes, we will do the last call. I mean, what's holding us? Okay, perfect. Somebody on the jabber? Um, yes, there's a question from Sergio Aquila. Is it possible to have a stable, uh, a variable tile size depending on the MTU? Why is only three? Yeah. Why did you pick only three bytes for the tile, or could you make it variable? By by definition, this is Dominic. By definition, the tile size is the, the fixed uh, value that fits all MTUs. That's how the system was built. So now, if you're saying you want a variable fixed minimum size and it's kind of meta redesigning the protocol so no the tile size is really this uh, minimum constant and then the otherwise the icon error doesn't work uh are we talking about icon error uh, by the way sergio if you... and yes. olivier will be at the link as well we'll okay. see you olivier Okay, so in Aconor, you need to be able to resend data that was lost. And if the MTU has been reduced, then you cannot send the same message as you sent before. You had to send smaller messages. And, and, and the new, the data that you're resending needs to fit somewhere in the reassembly buffer. And so the tile is this minimum piece that you with which you pave the, the whole uh, reassembly buffer. That's why it's fixed. Thanks, understood from Sergio. And, uh, but I, I would like to rephrase uh, what Sergio says. Maybe because here you take a value of three for every LoRa product, but if a product is just used for in Europe, then you, you take the US constraint, and maybe here you can have a bigger tile. <laughs> So let's hear what Olivier will say and I can answer. <laughs> we have Olivier as well. Yeah, um, we decided that for simplification and also in some future, we will have device going from US to Europe and China and so on, which will move around the globe. So it, it's already difficult to have something changing countries. We don't want to add more complexity on that. The, the cost is a um, wider, a bigger uh, bitmap, but most, most of the time it will be compressed. So it's acceptable cost. Makes sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Olivia. So, yeah, that's it. Oh, thank you. So, do we have any question? Um, there's one more from Edgar Ramos, but the tile size might be possible to be negotiated at protocol setup. Um, 
which protocol? Yes, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, this might be part of the bootstrapping. If there is something we do later, maybe we should change this behavior at that time. For example, yeah. Julien from Kering, so we could also define some rule IDs with different tile size. And as we are aiming to have a rule IDs in F ports, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, we come back to the argument that maybe the implementation will be a little bit more complex, but yeah, maybe it's still something worth considering. Dominique, yeah, you could either have uh, multiple rules in the same rule set with different tile sizes, but then you have the size of the rule ID that increases, or you could, as part of the provisioning protocol, you could provision rules that have different tile sizes. So, so the three is actually a must or should? I mean, how is it expressed right now? It's a must, I think. Yeah, I think it's a must. Well, then if you want one day to negotiate it, you'll do another RFC and you will say, oh, now it's negotiable and blah, blah, blah. But for now, all implementations will have to do three and that will be, that will mm. be it. So, yeah. If that's, if that's really what you want, that's what you get. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, we might consider whether it makes sense to make it a shoot or something, but it's okay. Yeah. Or you can have uh, some sentences that it might be overridden by some configuration. Just a sentence like this and mm -hmm. uh, some out of band uh, methods. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Yes, and water. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I have very few slides to, to present two things. The first one is a uh, data model, I think. It's um, the first, oh, Quap, up to you. Okay, so the, the data model, so to remind you what we have done in the in the chic draft is that we have a very abstract way to represent the rule. So we never say it's JSON, it's young, or we just as define, define it as an array. And now we need to have something more, more, more formal for different reasons. First one, you talk, Pascal talked before about uh, interoperability. For example, if we want to do interoperability testing between two implementations, so it's better to, to have a, a common format. We also managed it to um, to, man to have some management. It means that, for example, a device can change some parameter in the chic controller a compressor. We talk about the tie size. Maybe it's an opportunity to to do this uh, and extra size. So we need something that is uh, uh, standard. Another example is question that. Uh, say that maybe we can do a hash of the rule to be sure when for security reasons that we are using the same rule. And of course, if we do a hash, we need that the two end have the same, same representation. So we have to study a way to represent in a compact way, because we are in compact device, in an easy way, uh, this information. That's why we are going to investigate a young model to see if it fits all the requirement we need for uh, this uh, this management so we have already a draft that will expire soon that present the first uh, young model last year itf i presented also something that was more evolved on uh, on this young model but we are reaching our limits in uh, in young so that's why we we ask the ad we and uh, the chair to see if we can have contact with uh, the young doctor to see if we are starting well and we don't make some big mistakes that will appear uh, um, in the future. Yeah, so Christian. So you saw my request to the management AD a couple of weeks ago for a young doctor slot. I really hoped like you would have had a young doctor assigned to us by now, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So I'll just keep looking at it to uh, get something done. And um, 
So uh, if nothing happens, I'll probably talk to the secretary of the Yang Doctors with Mehmet. Like, you know, so I'll probably try to see if I can uh, get a response from the Yang Doctors directly. Okay, thank you. So this is uh, this is one point. So we will issue soon a, a new version of uh, our Yang model, and this one can be the base for uh, discussion. The other point that comes from uh, during the last call with the core. Uh, working group. So we, we had a proposal from uh, Karsten that says that we, for example, we have co-op option and for the moment we define in uh, LP1 a name for each co-op options. So for the moment it's okay because it's something that is internal to an application, but when we will go to that uh, young model, of course, we don't want to make twice the work and a core is defining some co-op option and then LP1 will have to redefine another space for this co-op option. So one proposal, but we, we have to discuss it, is for example to reserve in the seed space that represent all the value we are manipulating in, uh, in Chic, so some space for uh, the co-op option. And for example, here when we will have a US URI path, it's uh, value 11. So it will be the 11th place in this uh, space and et cetera, et cetera. So when core we create new co-op options, then automatically it will be present here and we don't have to do any translation. Currently the drawback of this is that we have to, uh, to take uh, 65,000 uh, places just for the seed space, which can be a lot. So I don't know if it's uh, reasonable or not to do that because the seed space can be very, very huge. So it's a possibility. So do we have to do it for a uh, co-op option? Do we have to do it for other value that we will find on protocol we, we compress? So currently that's uh, an open question and I would like to have your, your opinion on it. Laurent, you don't need to reserve the 65,000. You can re re pick 16,000 or even less, and then you will have a continuation code and you will pick a different range later. So it's not obliged to take the 65,000 right now. So you can yeah. take this approach with, you know. Well, Petro, uh, right now, I think you can have up to 1,000 seats in one block, but uh, if you decide to go this way, maybe we can change this or we can see what we can do about this. Just just invent a continuation code, like if your seed yeah. almost 1,000, it means go somewhere else as well. It's yeah, absolutely. Just that's perfectly possible. Because you'll have more ranges with huh? different ranges of co-op. Tons of ways of doing it without booking the 65,000. I'm sure you won't find one. Well. Don't move. That's, that's the last slide or... <coughs> Yeah, finished. Oh. So the next presenter will be Mr. Ah, yes. Laurent yeah. Tutin. Hmm? <laughs> what? I have not finished. What? I can leave to Anna if she wants. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a result of, we had a working group last call on uh, the co-op compression. It was also sent to the core working group to, to have uh, their feedback. So here is a result of this call. So we move from, uh, now we are in version nine of the, of the protocol. So uh, we have comments from uh, both groups about uh, what we are doing in, uh, uh, in, on this document, so thank you for all the reviewer. We have also a comment from Christian that he, we talk this uh, week, so it's not here. It's about to make a hash of the rules, the context in both sides when you are doing a score and include this hash in the AED when you are doing the encryption. So this way you are sure that both devices or the device and the chic core are using the same rules for the compression. So it's avoid to have confusion if, for example, you uh, you code a get into a deal and it's understood as a delete and of course you, you will have some uh, bad uh, behavior. 
So that's something we have also to include. So for, from my point of view, it's quite difficult right now to push it because we need this uh, data model before doing it. Because of course, if both sides uh, use a JSON definition and you have one space in one JSON definition and no space in the other one, so the hash will be different and it will be difficult to to manage. So it's something interesting, but how to integrate it right now, I, I don't see really how, how to do it. You want, okay. So uh, in V8, we we have only some uh, text edition, so nothing new. And in V9, we introduce or see also a command from the core working group. It was about ossification and the risk to say, okay, I am compressing this way, and then the co-op protocol will not evolve anymore because we have defined its version one, or we have a rule that say we have this and this and this, and if something new appears in um, in a core working group, then it it will maybe block by uh, the fact that she cannot evolve. So this is something that is not uh, really a problem from the chic point of view because chic is very generic. And when the device uh, evolves, then the rules will evolve. And if, when everything is designed as a field, we have a way to compress it, to manipulate it. So it's not a real problem, but we had some text to say that there is no risk of ossification with, uh, with Chic. Okay, so uh, here is what I said before with uh, Karsten remark is what put the co-op space into, into Chic, so this way you don't have trouble. And I cover this point with uh, the data model. And so we have finished with uh, working also as call. All the ticket has been closed and we answer all the questions. So now I turn to the chair. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to find a shepherd. Yeah. So probably uh, Alex, but Otherwise, we might. I mean, if somebody is interested in, in trying the exercise of being the shepherd of this document, we can help that person through the process too. So it's, it's an interesting learning curve. So always open. The, the shepherd is not named right now. So, but if I'm, I'm happy to take volunteers if anybody wants to try the game. Mm. Either you, you want to try to be a shepherd? I, I will help you through, it's, it's not. Uh, hello, if I'm here. Uh, I have been shepherding one document for Cozy already, so I have okay, some so idea you, about it. Uh, okay. I might have a little bit more load on Cozy, but I will see, and if I have the time for this, I mean, I will send you an Come email. Come back to Alex and me. Yeah, uh, exactly. Okay. okay. Awesome. Sash. I can pick somebody like you, so I'll just like look for somebody and like probably even outside the group to just do it just to get. Please, I mean, because it's open. I, I mean, I, I like to like have that. new eyes basically. Exactly. That gives us an additional. Well, right? like, you know, I wanted to make sure that like, you know, we also get like. That gives us an additional review and additional scrutiny, so it's good. Um, quick comment from Alexander Pilov. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Josh. Hello again. This is an update on the OM uh, draft. Um, so the purpose of this draft is to uh, uh, discuss the OM uh, methods and, and protocols for IoT in the context of Czech. Um, so we want to start with uh, real simple stuff, things that people do expect when they have IP connectivity, so they expect uh, ICMP error messages when something goes wrong uh, along the path. They want to be able, they want to, be able to ping uh, their destination and maybe run a trace route um, to troubleshoot 
initial problems. Um, and so we want to discuss what and, and define what we want to do in the context of IoT. Uh, does that all make sense? And, and you know, how do we handle that? And first, to keep it simple, we want to address the uh, methods and messages uh, in RFC 4443 and not the extended uh, stuff. So this is a, I'll come to a question shortly. This is a kind of scenarios we considered, so this is already a year old. Um, oops, wrong button. Obviously from the internet, if you have IP connectivity, people want to, as I said, get the ICMP v6 error message back, they want to be able to do a ping at trace route. So what do we do? Uh, if the, the error, the problem happens somewhere here on the LP1, uh, what kind of response do we send back? Do we want to propagate those into the LP1 network or not? Is it safe? Is it reasonable, etc.? And also on the, the other way, uh, probably we want an ICMP v6 error message back from the device if it sends an IPv6 message, uh, but we don't expect the device to run a trace route because uh, you know, there's nobody, there's no keyboard, whatever. So. This is probably not something we want to consider. Uh, a ping might be something realistic for a device to do. Uh, so this draft is first discussing the use cases and then providing uh, solutions. Julia, you wanted to? You answered my question, Julia from uh, Kerling. Uh, running trace, is it really useful to run trace, trace route? Uh, uh, in a LP1 uh, architecture, because the last op is should be none, or is is uh, actually having that implemented on the device? I don't see things, but you answer that. Okay. What what we can imagine also is that the trace route stop at uh, compressor, and you have a specific message that say after that it's LP1 network. So that could be interesting. That could be a security issue. It's we have to discuss about that. Yeah, it's really a discussion. We, we, by no means do we uh, think we have the definite answer to all these questions. So it's really a debate that needs to take place. So since uh, Pascal Tuber is an individual contributor, um, since you've mentioned error, ICMP error, I'm aware, so it's an IPR alert, I'm aware of IPR whereby code in the gateway is not really the context of shake or, or LP1, but similar, it's code in, in uh, something like the gateway would actually offload uh, the error processing from the device. And possibly okay. generate SCMP errors on behalf of the device. And that could be Mac, for instance, any logical function like Mac that would do that. Okay, so there's our IP, IPR on this topic, if, if good to know. Then, then, I know that this IPR can be disclosed to the ATF and we have all the run terms, but they just tell you if it exists. Okay. I'm Bob Moss, Chris, I'm looking at your slide there. I'm wondering if it was, if you intended it, that some typo on the top pairing, you have IPv6 on the top and ICMPv6 underneath. Um, is there some specific uh, intimation of why the directions are named differently, or is that uh, accidental? Yeah, what we mean to describe here is scenario. So we're saying we we think uh, it would be interesting for a device when they send an IPv6 message out, and there's some issue with this IPv6 message in the network that they are able to receive the ICMPv6 error message back, uh, and conversely on the other side. But definitely we have IPv6 flowing both ways and ICMPv6 flowing both ways. But this is a scenario on the device side and scenario. Very unclear hmm? Very unclear the intent of the picture. OK, that's why the, the talk comes with it. <laughs> Thank you for the comment anyway. Um, so we haven't, honestly, we haven't worked at all on this since uh, last meeting. Uh, how, except for this hackathon where uh, Laura implemented um, this part. So 
we got the code into the, the chic core on this side. And when we said an, a ping from the internet, then the chic core, uh, instead of forwarding the ping and compressing it and forwarding to the device, will respond with an, um, an echo reply um, on behalf of the device. Uh, and the way we did it, which is interesting, is uh, kind of reuse the, uh, the compressor implementation, which has a matching part. Uh, we, we look at rules and we have a matching pattern and then we apply it for compression and then we added a few hooks such that when this matching part matches, then we call a special code that sends a, a echo reply back. So just a point of reference, we have some of this working. So uh, regarding that, uh, that uh, use case, is it going to be something to make sure that the end device is actually alive before replying with a pin back to the, because otherwise you're not making sure that the IP should respond with a pin, right? Right, that's a very valid question. It's all part of the discussion that needs to take place and I need to revive this discussion is what do we want to do? What do we expect? Uh, certainly not responding to the pin ping at all is probably a bad idea in general because people expect that you know they have an ipv6 device uh, they have some host with an ipv6 address they expect to get some answer back to the ping but what kind of answer do we want to send uh, uh, how long has the device been uh, i mean how far back has the device been seen <laughs> uh, for us to decide that we want to send a reply i don't know could be an hour, could be a day, very much depends on the network, on the class of device, if it's class A, class C. Of course, it's, if it's lower one class C, you expect, it, you expect an immediate answer back. Uh, if it's class A, you understand that it may be uh, sleeping, you know, for hours in a row. So it's all part of the discussion okay. uh, on the opening questions at this point. Yes, for the moment, we also, for example, if you see a traffic in the last five minutes and you answer to the ping, and if you don't see any traffic, so you don't answer, and so this way, with a management tool, you can see if your device is active or not. Yeah, it's emulating the liveliness of the device and, you know, Laurent picked five minutes just for running the test. But, um, okay. So uh, next steps and change from last time, uh, discuss the use cases on the mailing list. So I, I will revive this discussion, definitely. Uh, is there some other uh, useful OEM stuff that we want to do in the context of IoT and LP ones? And then implement and play with this stuff. Okay. No more questions? Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez and I'm going to present an update of the draft entitled RTO considerations in LP1. So first of all, uh, a reminder on the motivation for this document. We have that in, in many LP1 scenarios, we have long or very long RTTs. In ideal scenarios, we may have RTTs already in the order of seconds or tens of seconds. And due to a number of phenomena, we may also have higher order RTDs with values up to several minutes or even more. So as a consequence, the RTD in LP1 and also the, the variance of the RTD is much greater than the typical one on the internet. For comparison, uh, the default RTO in TCP is currently one second and the default RTO in CoAP is randomly chosen between two and three seconds. So we have these particular RTD characteristics in, in LP1s, however, uh, we also have retransmission timers. For example, uh, when we use CoAP in LP1 and we send a con message, there will be a retransmission timer running. And also 
she defines two modes, uh, a call with and a con error that use retransmission timers as well. So the question here is, okay, how do we deal with these particular characteristics of RTTs in LP1? So the status of the document is as follows. The initial version of the draft was presented in Prague. It contained an analysis of uh, what we now call the Appling RTT. This is a round trip where the first message is in the Appling, the, the response comes in the downlink. And also it contained a proposal for an algorithm for the RTO. And in this update, we have added this terminology of Appling RTT or Downlink RTT. By the way, the latter is uh, the opposite. So the, the first packet is in the Downlink in that case. And also we've added a Downlink RTT analysis. Also in this presentation, I'll show an example of some preliminary evaluation results of the proposed RTO algorithm uh, obtained by simulation. So regarding the Downlink RTT analysis, we can identify that it comprises two components. The first one is the wait time until the next uplink transmission. And this is because in uh, technologies such as Sigfox or LoRaWAN class A, a downlink packet can only be sent uh, in a dedicated time window that has been offered as, as a result of a previous uplink transmission. Therefore, this, this component, this wait time, will depend on the application and it might take values such as in the order of seconds, minutes, hours. Although it's true that there are also some special cases where if we know in advance that we want to perform, when do we want to perform a downlink transmission, it would be possible also to program beforehand uh, some uplink transmission so that it might be possible to minimize uh, this component, ideally even down to zero. And then the second component in the downlink RTT would be the time since the uplink has been completed until the whole downlink RTT has been completed. And we call this second component a basic downlink RTT. Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos uh, in the In the lower one, the numbers, uh, which class of uh, device are you using? Is it ABC? I understand, well, this is class A. Plus A, so, so yeah. you have to send the uplink before. Yeah, so th these numbers are only for the second component. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is after the uplink has been done, yeah. So um, we have added the theoretical analysis similar to the one that already existed in the document, that was for the uplink RTT. Now we have added these numbers which correspond to basic downlink RTT for lower one plus A and also for Sigfox for a variety of, uh, well, data rates and uplink bid rates respectively. And the conclusion is similar to the one that we identified for the uplink RTT values, which is that in many cases we have RTOs which are already greater than the default uh, co-op RTO. Then in the document, there's also discussion of approaches uh, for the RTO. So in, perhaps in some cases, delay might not be relevant for the application. So in that case, uh, what one can do is just set the RTO to the highest expected RTT in order to avoid spurious retries, and, and that's it. However, if delay is actually relevant for the application, meaning that it, it makes a difference to retry after one second compared to retrying after 100 seconds. And also if we expect to find higher order RTTs in our scenario, then we might consider using an algorithm such as the one that's presented here. We call it dual RTO algorithm. And it is a, basically a two state uh, machine where there's two separate RTO algorithms used uh, there is the high RTO state, which uses one RTO algorithm, uh, which is initialized to values that are compatible with high RTTs. Then there's a low RTO state, which uses a separate RTO algorithm, which is consistent with low RTT values. So for example, if we are in the high RTO state, and then we obtain a number of consecutive low RTT samples, then the mechanism switches to using the low RTO algorithm and vice versa. Uh, in the other case. So this is just an example to illustrate what we could get 
um, where we compare what happens if we are using a standard single TCP RTO, which uh, corresponds to the curve in red. Uh, here in this figure, we, we show the RTO values produced by this standard TCP RTO compared with the ones that would be produced by the dual RTO algorithm, which are the ones in green, when there's, as an input, the sequence of RTT values that are shown in blue in the figure. As you can see, this sequence in this example is basically that RTTs are by default low, like around one second, and then there are a couple of intervals in which the RTTs are around 100 seconds. And we can observe that the TCP RTO, so if we use a, a single RTO here, it struggles with the variance of the RTT, that's the result of the, the change of the RTT state, and the TCP RTO <laughs> produces very large values, even up to 300 seconds. You can see also that it takes some time to converge for the single TCP RTO. Uh, and also, uh, the worst case is when the RTT is already one second. And meanwhile, during this convergence phase, after a transition of the RTT values, the TCP RTO is still with values of 300, 200, 100 seconds. Uh, in contrast with the dual RTO, as soon as uh, there's the detection of a change of the RTT state, it, it switches to the appropriate uh, RTO algorithm. By the way, in this simulation, what we use is two separate TCP RTOs. However, however one is uh, initialized to values compatible with high RTTs. The other one is suitable for low RTTs. And as you can see, the dual RTO is able to follow the RTT much closer than the TCP RTO. So, um, one consideration here is that it is actually possible, or that's the assumption, to know a priori in advance which will be the high RTT values. For example, if the high RTT intervals are due to packets being buffered in a gateway that then can only be sent because of some uplink transmission that allows that downlink transmission, then it means that the RTT is actually related, it depends with the time between uplink messages. Also, another observation is that the amount of improvement that can be achieved will depend on the actual statistics, for example, the duration of the high or low RTT intervals. So, well, this was just an example. And, well, there are some questions for the group. And uh, one is, okay, is there interest in this work? And, and then if yes, then there's a related question, which is, okay, this document contains somewhat hybrid content, like informational doc uh, content about settings for the RTO, but also then also a, an experimental kind of algorithm for the RTO, and also connected with transport area stuff. So, well, what do you think? Uh, so, uh, my feeling is that we have a cross-layer issue. That's, that's the main thing which is like, basically, you've got this timeout, whatever it is, at the upper layer, which says, hey, probably my message was not received. And as it goes, there might be an upper layer acknowledgement sitting on the gateway, but, but your problem is to pull it, right? And there's chicken and egg between timing out the device and, and getting this message. Because if you time out, you send a message that will pull it, but then you will also give an, uh, information to the other side that something was lost, which is not the case. So, because it's just waiting for you on the gateway. So, so we, we are missing this, this interface between the, the upper layer, whether it's transport or application above co-op, whereby the transport or application, when it times out, instead of creating a, a real application ever, ever, ever tend to add, etc., to do a retry or whatever, first does something which has a result of pulling stuff. And then if that doesn't work, then the real timeout can happen. But, I think we need to describe that model because it's, it's pretty new to, 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 to the model where you need a message, a layer two message that doesn't go further than the gateway to just try to empty the queue. So that's the first thing, I, we need to document that. Now the second thing I have is, no, I don't believe that you can, without any cross layer or interaction like that, that you can tell what the bounded value is for the long RTO because the queuing theory will tell you that if you get more message from the network into the gateway queue, you, know, you get them faster than, than you pull them, then that queue can become infinite. 
right, in theory. So, so if that Q is infinite and it's, it's being you know, emptied at the speed at which you pull it, then you cannot, the RTO can go infinite as well. So we must have some methods to control the size of the Q on the gateway and <laughs> pull it. So, so the bigger scheme in which this thing works has to be described. Yeah, thank Sarah you. Minabolo. So um, until now we have already we have taken the device as a device that we know. But I think in our P1 networks the device is a kind of different. It not only have a different RTT, it sends differently, it's asymmetric, uh, timers are different, so the response is different. Uh, until now, we have not studied all the parameters that this device uh, will react um, slowly, I would say, compared to what we know. So, I don't know, um, this is one first step, I would say, uh, of all these parameters that may change with this new uh, asymmetric slow or low power than mine. So, uh, I think it's interesting. Um, and perhaps not only the RTT, we have many things to study. Uh, I don't know if we want to make one document for each one, or we can make the cross layer a study of all these parameters that need uh, some new configuration uh, compared to this. Uh, LP1 networks. Yeah, thank you. I understand that um, next step would be trying to identify like which are which is the the set of parameters. Perhaps not only RTT, as you say. Uh, to my mind, comes for example, inactivity timers may also have some dependencies, some relationship with this content. And yes, uh, from there we might be able to see if it makes sense to to consider a set of parameters performance parameters or behavior parameters in, in the same document, or perhaps if there's some uh, different nature, like study them separately. Yeah. Yeah, but also the, the asymmetric part is important. Yes. Yes, uh, so, Chair Hatton, I would really welcome a prime statement document which explains what are the implications of this pool model on the upper layers, like, like TCP or whatever application of our co-op. Once we understand what the primes are, then we can look at solutions like this, right? But we need a greater context. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing is probably to write this private statement. And yes, uh, I would welcome that. Peter van der Stok, did you consider Markov modeling for this problem? Uh, not yet, but... Uh, it might be very appropriate. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Now, to tie support this work, I think it's very important because with Chic we are hiding the fact that we are behind the LP1 network, so we have to adapt the server and the other components. So it's very important to have such a thing. Thank you. Thank you, Carles. Do we have any more um, discussion on this topic? I mean, it's probably one of our more critical topics to discuss with in the future. So. Nothing? Okay, so the last topic, probably Suresh, is uh, the rechartering games. So I did not pull again the slides, we've, we've presented them a number of times. Um, I can, we just need to point on IETF 101 instead of IETF 105 on the data tracker. Uh, so, so basically the, 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 the bottom line is we, are, we have split the first um, item of the agenda into what is complete, which is the main chic document, um, what is well on the way, which is the chic over full document, which should uh, adapt the chic profiles for the particular um, technologies, and then the chic profile itself, which will be the young model that, that, that we have now. And so, so that basically the, the three main items and um, we, we have added a new item in the proposed charter for uh, what has become the, the ICMP OAM draft, right? So this is pretty much what we are asking. So Suresh, how do you see the next phase with, it looks, you know, we're 
We have documents for those as charter items. We are in very good shape already. Answer this question. So you already discussed the chart on the mailing list, if I remember correctly. Right? Several times we've so. presented it at right. ITF 101. So if it's um, not changed, just like um, put the chart in and send it to me, I'll, I'll, I'll put it and start the rechatting process in the IESG. Uh, I just want to wait till the um, SHIG document is done with the IESG. So that's like, I think, the 22nd or something. And then ship out the text to me. I'll put in a new version of the charter. And there's like a bunch of the steps to go through. So I need to do like an informal review, an internal review, and an external review. So it's, each of them is about like two weeks long. So it's about like six weeks from then. We'll I mean, have we've been time. working for one year plus on the charter items anyway. It's just it's just that, um, so, so the discussion to, of today about this RTO and cross-layer issues due to the pull model, you know, you have to send a message to get a message back. Um, the more and more we talk about it, the more and more it seems like it's an important topic for us. So should we, modify the charter as you've seen it since last year or to, to have a topic like this program statement to start with i think that's fine like that's fine. like so you have like three weeks now right like to like and put it on so like you know say like you know is are is the working group interested in doing it and then their yeah, consensus just add it in okay. okay okay so we'll go through the mailing list ask if we have interest in this program statement and i guess the r2 discussion will come naturally out of that work and then we'll charter for it if you know if people are ready for it that's good. Okay. And, okay. and that will also lead to the uh, deliverables, right? So add a milestone for it and so on. If, if it's, I mean, so, yeah. soon as you approve the charter. No, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So add it to the areas we work on, but also add a deliverable. So if, if it's just a problem statement or you want to work on solution and so on, right? So that's kind of like make them deliverables because like a lot of the times uh, people are saying, okay, what do you want to deliver as well, right? So I think keep those two separate because like one of them we can change easier than the other. So make sure it's in the charter and that yeah. and we can work uh, the so, so I mean question to the room right now, right? Do we put the prime statements an obvious one? That, that do we already put the RTO in the new charter? Is it something I mean I would like to get the person of the room. I mean, are we ready to work on the RTO already? Does it make sense for everybody? Please, if you think we should char include the RTO discussion that has presented in the next charter, please hum. I repeat because the hum was light. If you think, <laughs> please listen, <laughs> wake up. You cannot like, change the result. No. no, no, I just want to make sure because I see people not doing their mail because nobody does that. So, so um, please listen. If you, if you care about the RTO work in this working group, so we already include it in the charter, please hum. If you don't think this group should work on RTO problems, please hum. But the train doesn't want to work on it. Yeah, so just uh, confirm on the list and you're good to go. Okay, good. This is Anna again. Um, how about working about uh, um, lightweight MTM overshoot? I missed your question, Anna. How about we make uh, Lightweight M2M over chic. M2M over chic or chic over? Lightweight M2M. Ah, oh, oh, compression, lightweight M2M. Okay. Mailing list? I mean, the, we have three weeks. So we, we've proven quite efficient on the technologies we have. Uh, so we are doing this DLMS thing already. I mean, some people are working on it. So why not? I mean, if, if there is document, I mean, I would like to see the document, right? Maybe maybe start with the document, show us that there is something to do. Uh, and, well, you need to publish, like, in the coming weeks now. Uh, Julien from Kelly, I would support such uh, such work. I wait into Okay, so we'll we'll pull the mailing list on this. It would be great to have a document which shows, you know, what, what kind of delta. I have just no clue what's missing in Chic as it stands today to do lightweight M2M, if there are new methods or if it's more like the co-op one. Um, so, so please publish something so, so I, at least we understand what the problem is. Uh, Christian Andres, from my understanding of lightweight M2M over co-op, this may not be much more than de defining a few more Chic compression options and then describing that it can be done with the a technolo existing technology. But of course it needs to be explored. Okay. So it's pretty much like co-op then, the same degree of work. 
I mean, please, please start the doc yesterday. I mean, um, is that the full charter or there is the next item? Then the charter. Yes. The, the yeah. Because, well, my, my question is, um, do we have any way to, to provide the standard, I'm not saying rules, but... Um, yes, yes, uh, so, so if, if you care, let's, let's go through, through those slides again. So basically, that was the current, that was the old charter, okay? And so the old charter had a very big uh, item one. I'm um, sorry, item two, which was, which we actually split, as you can see. Okay, and then I will go through charter to through the rework charter. Okay, so it's in it. So the charter two, yes, exactly. So we split those things into. Um, so the chic is what we are done. Uh, so the, the, your question is the, the item two, I guess, it's the data model, right? Okay. And so um, item three is the. All the, the um, technology specific documents. And the only new item, really, from the old charter was this uh, OAM work that Dominique has presented. Right, so, all those things we've been discussing today. So, the young model is item two in the new charter. And now we will add an item which would discuss the primes due to the pool model. And as deliverables, we would have a prime statement and a work on RTO. That would be the new thing and then probably yet another um, deliverable to be added to actually item three so item three is a uh, uh, chic well is it item three or item one uh, about you know uh lightweight m2m over uh, compression well, just the like thing i'm looking at is an easy way to use chic to make it use very easily to be used that's there well that's what's only my problem. write a library and <laughs> everybody can include it Okay, so yes, the profile is exactly for that. Uh, we'll need documents in the profile game. We'll need a document which kind of express expresses how we expect to to push the profile, the, the, the new format, on both sides, and and probably there will be a need for a provisioning uh, flow which explains how that happens. And if we if we actually sign the rules, then we'll have to to explain how we make it so that the rules that are the same on both sides so the signature works. So, so all this should be in a document somewhere. Okay, and we, we, we had a, a, a last uh, item for today, which was a presentation of 802.15.4 by Charlie and, and Bob. But as it goes, uh, Charlie is not there. He did not register to meet Echo. So I guess we will rethink on what's going on at 802.15.4 at the next IATF, which means that we are pretty much down and you can, um, basically be the first in the queue for food, which is a good news. So unless there is any question, we will adjourn right now. Okay, so enjoy food, enjoy Montreal if you're not living right now. And uh, see you in uh, Singapore. Don't eat chewing gum. So everybody sign the blue sheets before you go. Blue sheet signed, blue sheet signed. Okay, well, we're gonna take the blue sheets to the right here. No. Ah, c'est très joli.